Hello, and welcome to Grow and Give, our modern victory garden project. Hello, this is our webinar on seed starting, the first part. My name is Cassie Anderson. I work in Adams County managing the Master Gardener program, and today we'll be going through the beginnings of what it takes to start your seeds. So why is it important to start seeds? For one, it is very cost effective to start from seed. You can often buy a seed packet for $3, whereas you can buy a single seedling for $3 or $5. And so if you're looking at planting a lot of something, then it's much more effective to get one packet that might have 50 or 100 or more, if you're looking at some seeds, than a single seedling. You can also really find hard to find species and varieties that are a little bit more specialized or unique. It's also possible to pinpoint your timing for planting. Sometimes if you're working from plants that you're getting from a nursery, they might not be at the stage you want when you're ready to get planting. And when you start them yourself, you can really plan out when you're going to be planting. And a little bit later in one of the other other webinars will be going into some detailed calculations on how to figure out the timing for planting. You can control the growth. Um, some seedlings are best when transplanted when that first set of true leaves have actually emerged, and so it's useful to actually have that control because if they get too big then they get really sensitive to transplanting. And if you plant a few extras, you've got something to help sweeten the pot when your neighbor's been curious about gardening, or if you've got friends and family who are wanting to get started, or maybe you're the person who starts all of the tomatoes and your friend starts all of the melons or cucumbers, and you can kind of do a, a switch. And most importantly, I think it's, it's fun. It's so satisfying to start seeds when we're in our gray and maybe rainy or snowy spring or wintertime weather, and you can kind of have that bright section of your basement or back room where you're starting your seeds and you've got a light going on and a heat mat and things are cozy and you can see things, something grow from what looks like nothing. It's, it's kind of a magical moment, really. So I think it's really fun. So we'll kind of look at how seeds work, what the mechanisms behind them are. The seed in its most basic instance is the reproductive material of a plant. All, all plants make seeds. Um, some plants we don't use their seeds because it's not the most effective or efficient way to get seeds. But most plants do have a seed in some, some sense, uh, whether or not it's something we recognize as a seed. And so here you can see some different examples if you've got your corn in the bottom left or your fruit trees. The seeds in an apple are going to give you that next generation. There are two different types of plants. Um, when you're looking and thinking of seeds, you can kind of think of plants in two different ways. You, the monocots versus the dicots. And we've got a lot of categories for our vegetables in both of those sections. And we'll kind of look at how they grow and react differently depending on what type they are. But if you're looking at the differences, just to familiarize yourself, monocots usually have that single cotyledon, dicots have two cotyledons, in monocots those veins are usually parallel, uh, they have a more fibrous root system, flower parts are usually in multiples of three, uh, for dicots, they usually are more likely to have a tap root, and the flower part, floral parts are normally in multiples of four or five. Kind of when you look around, you can kind of take a look and see what, what things you think might be a monocot and what you might think are a dicot. And then there's a nice little list here on the right hand side of the different plants that fit into those categories. So like your rice and your wheats, your onions and garlic, those are all monocots. Your beans and squash, cucumbers, peas, those are all dicots. So when you're looking at your seed, you've got on top, on the top here, you've got the dicot, on the bottom you've got the monocot, um, and you can see the different parts of the seed. Almost all seeds will have this seed coat. This seed coat is a protective layer to help the seed keep all itself intact while it's waiting for the, for the 
environment to be right to allow for germination. Inside that seed coat, you've got all of the things that that seed needs to succeed in growing until it has enough roots and enough leaves to start being a self-contained plant. So most importantly in that is that endosperm and the cotyledon, those areas that hold the nutrients and the life-giving force that gives that seed the oomph it needs to get, to get started and to get growing. If you look at a dicot, once the, the conditions have become right and the seed has taken in enough water, taken in enough light if it needs it, and enough air, it signals rapid cell, cell division and cell multiplication so that the radical and the hypocotyl will actually start to elongate. The radical is the part that be eventually becomes the root. The hypocotyl will become the stem with those cotyledons acting sort of as a false leaf until the true leaves emerge. And fairly often when you're talking about seed starting, those true leaves are a really important part of the plant growth because the true leaves are what start to have that photosynthesis, that process of photosynthesis, which will allow the plant to feed itself instead of relying on that internal nutrients that was stored in the cotyledon itself. For monocots, the process is relatively similar. You've still got that radical that it, those cells elongate and divide into what will eventually be the root. And you have the coleoptile, which will eventually become those foliage leaves once the plant gets, gets growing far enough. And for that, for that process, it's, it's, it's very similar. It just happens in a slightly different way in a monocot than it does in a dicot. You aren't going to see those big leafy cotyledons the same as you would on a dicot. So if you're looking for those, you might miss them. Sometimes with both of these, you will see the seed coat kind of emerges on top uh, of the the plant itself, or the emerging part of the plant, that can be brushed off. It's perfectly fine. It doesn't. It doesn't need to be there anymore. Just be gentle, and so that you're not damaging the plant itself. All right. We'll get a little bit more into the process of germination and growing in a little bit, but I wanted to talk about reading seed labels so that you can figure out what you need to really guarantee some success. We've got some examples here of some commercial seed packets. Um, we'll also have some consumer seed packets that we'll take a look at so you can see the kind of information that you might be getting. On a commercial seed packet, you're more likely to see things like the testing date, the rate of germination, lot number, so that you can refer to the seed or to the company in very specific terms if there are problems or complications while you're working with this particular packet. All seeds should also tell you when they were packed um, so that you know that they are ready and, and good for a certain amount of time. Some seeds have a very long shelf life, especially unfortunately our weedy seeds. They can live for hundreds of years. Other seeds might only live for two or, or might, might only be really strongly viable for two or three years. That's one reason when you see a seed packet, it always tells you to store it in a dry, cool location so that you don't run the risk of starting the germination process too early or making, like if, the, if some seeds are intolerant of freezing, if that seed freezes, then it's going to be problematic in the long term. Some of the more consumer level seed packets give you a lot of information about this, the plant that you're going to be growing so that you know what to do. On the outside of the package, you're always going to see what the variety is. Usually you'll see a picture, whether it's like this one is an illustration or it is a photograph. It should tell you the scientific name. Scientific names are very useful because they give you a lot of specific detail. It should tell you how long it takes to get to maturity when you should plant it. Usually the seed packet will tell you how to space that seedling. Um, and it should also tell you whether it will require thinning, um, and how much sun it might need. It might tell you when it should be blooming or when you might be starting to expect some kind of crop from it. 
it usually will give you some kind of description for the plant as well. Some seed packets are a little bit more generic on this, some get very much into detail. And some packets like this particular company, they give you information on the inside of the seed, it's a seed packet as well. And on the inside, this particular company goes a little bit more into the history, the things that you can do with it. And one thing I really like is they show you a picture of the seedling. Um, and so that lets you actually get a sense of what that seedling will look like. I know when I first started working with plants and with gardening, I accidentally roged out, I accidentally weeded out seedlings not realizing that's what they look like when they're little because those cotyledons fairly often are very different in shape and size than the true leaf itself. So it's, not, it's useful when you get that kind of information and if your seed packet doesn't have it you can usually find the information on the internet or contact your ex local extension office and we can help you out as well. So you've got your seeds, you're getting ready to go, what do you need to get started? You definitely need some kind of container, whether that be like a plastic cell plat pack, an open flat, something like this jiffy pot system, or some kind of kitchen container that you've repurposed. You can choose anything. You want to make sure if it's something you're repurposing that it's well washed out and that it's something that's really good to go. These jiffy systems are nice because that's a cocoa coir little mini pot and it, it swells up once you add water and makes a nice little planting pot. Most things that you are planting in there you will need to up pot into something larger once they have gotten a little bit bigger. You also definitely need to perhaps have some kind of medium that you're planting into. Generally speaking it's most advisable to use a seed starting mix, not a potting mix, not a garden soil. Seed starting mixes are sterilized a little bit more carefully. There are some problems such as dampening off that can occur if you're using things that are not using potting media that is not properly sterilized. So that potting mix could have fungal issue, fungal contaminants in it that will cause your seedling to not have a very long life. Uh, garden soil is also one that is actually designed to be planted out in your yard. It's not designed to be used in a container itself. So if you can find a seed starting mix, it's a really good way to go. You can sterilize old mixes if you have a way to heat the soil for long enough, but it's something you're not going to want to do in your own home because it does tend to make quite a stink. So something to avoid. It's also important that you have some way to get water to your plants. If you have a, the ability to have a hose or a small line, then you can use a mist head. A small watering can can let you water from underneath with that jiffy pot method. You do want to have a really low water pressure when you're using a system like that. Lighting is important. Supplemental lighting is almost always required. You can have a setup like this, like in this picture on the bottom left, where you kind of put your plants in the window with an angle, but most seedlings benefit most from anywhere between 12 and 16 hours of sunlight or of light in a day. And so window locations rarely have sufficient light. If you do have a setup like that, you'll want to rotate the tray around to make sure that those seedlings grow as straight as possible. Supplemental lighting, you can use your standard shop light with a, one cool bulb and one warm bulb in it, or increasingly, it's becoming so affordable to purchase these LED grow lights like you can see on the right hand side here. These LEDs have the right wavelengths of light for optimal plant growth, and you want to make sure that that light is as close as possible to your seedlings so that they get the light benefit. And if you can put it on a chain so that it actually rises up, that would be most beneficial. And finally, you want some way to keep the humidity high in the area and a way to keep the seedlings warm. We'll talk about how warm, how warmth is important in germination later, but a heat mat is going to be very important in keep regulating the temperatures in your setup. Some of them are programmable, some of them are not, um, but keeping them warm is a really good idea. Having a timer so that you know so that you can set when the lights are on and off is usually useful. You can have it so that it, the lights are on for 16 hours a day and then have them off for the remainder of the day. And labeling is really important for your, your seedling setup as well. 
make sure that you label uniformly. If you're planting in successions or planting this in the same container, make sure those labels all read the same direction so that you don't double plant or misplant. And that's going to end us for this section. We'll come back in a, the next section to talk a little bit more about germination and the processes of that.